Hey there, this is Ben Sanford with Tribal Edge, and this is a attempt at the eight man response to John Verveke's Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. So um, <clears throat> I did a little introduction on this if you're interested in looking at what I'm trying to do here, but if you are already aware of John Verveke's work and its impact, um, awesome. And if you're not, this may be for you. Um, and actually, if you are aware, this might be for you too. So what I'm trying to do is kind of get provide a um, interpretation or a translation between kind of what I perceive as the theoretical and um, fairly deeply intellectual <clears throat> um, work and a little more grounded um, kind of hands-on version for people who like to ape around like myself. So uh, I am a nature educator, um, I guess, <laughs> I have a school called Tribal Edge, and I, um, I work with people in reestablishing and remembering their connection to the rest of nature. In fact, I don't even like to use the us and nature distinction. I don't think that's useful. I think it's important really important to remember that we are nature and we are just part of that continuum so <clears throat> um as i am a nature educator that also means i'm a human educator and um what happens in our work in the skills of living with the earth is there's a lot of transformative stuff that happens um a lot of insight into self and into the way things are and the way things work and into our own perception and part of that, I think, is because there's such direct feedback from the earth itself. Um, and it's unavoidable, you know, if you go to have an experience outside and the conditions aren't like you expected or hoped, um, you can't really do much about that. You know, it's kind of outside of our, our uh, structures to control that. So. You know, one of the things that I've found in the nature education sphere is that it's working in a complex environment and in, in many ways a complex adaptive environment, which means that a lot of the rules or um, practices that work in the lab or work in our civilized containers don't work in the same way. They don't, they're not as reliable. In fact, they can actually get us into trouble. So it's a whole different way of going, a whole different method and a whole different approach that um, ties into the rest of life very well because life, you know, as human beings is a complex thing. So uh, that's one thing I enjoy about uh, working in that arena. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, Let's see where to start. So I wasn't really, I wasn't sure how to start this and where, where to begin. But in some ways, I don't think it really matters because it's, it's all going to connect back to everything else. But uh, there is kind of a progression in our training. Definitely a progression. And it's, it's progression in a cycle or in a um, um, systematic rhythm. And it's layered in depth and it's also uh, layered in span. So it's both broad and deep and it takes kind of a slow and gentle pace to grasp the nature of these, of the nature connection. So um, in many ways you can run right past it without uh, getting it because you're looking for it, you're trying. So, so anyway, I wanna, you know, I'm gonna do my best to kind of keep this relatively simple and it might totally not be and that's fine too but um you know it's just a, a a stab here so but what inspired me to do this particular talk is i just recently watched uh john verveke paul vanderclay and jonathan pajot talking about emergence and narrative <clears throat> and you know that was excellent it was I, I love that whole thing, and it was uh, really spoke to me in a lot of different ways. But at one point, they 
uh, kind of pause to try to articulate the problem or the argument that they were working on and so that no one else would be lost. And I thought that was really cool. And in doing so, um, John in particular articulated the problem that he's working on in a really concise way. And I thought that was super valuable. In fact, he spoke to what he kind of his core concept of his work, which he calls relevance realization, which um, I'll talk about a little bit, but I'm not going to, I don't quite feel prepared to try to describe that entirely. Um, he takes a long time to describe it. So if anything, I'll just be giving a kind of a tops of the trees interpretation of it. But um, as they were talking though, what happened was <clears throat> I, um, I keep coming back to our nature skills or practices, I'm gonna call them practices, but they involve what we would see as skills and tools. And more than that, they involve the, um, the four types of knowing that John talks about as well. The propositional knowing, you know, the, the facts and, and kind of that kind of knowledge or, or beliefs, but also the perspectival knowing, the, the way of seeing and, and um, being able to take different perspectives and knowing what something's like. And then um, the procedural knowledge, which is really big, which is, you know, all the skill development and training, which uh, leads to uh, change, changing your capacity to function. And then the participatory knowing, which is um, being part of something and knowing what it's like to belong, I, guess, I suppose. So um, those are all very important and necessary in the training that we do. We really can't get around them. Uh, in fact, the way I teach, which is, I'm gonna do another video on, <clears throat> on that, which is our teaching methodology. Just briefly, it's uh, called coyote teaching, which is how I learned, which is a process of indirect transmission, you might say. So you are trying to uh, allow people to encounter things uh, by their own means and to develop relationships with what you are hoping they learn or with, with the content without you being, without me being an intermediary. So it's, um, it's an old way of learning and it's a very powerful way of learning and it, and it really fulfills the, the four kinds of knowing um, really well, as well as the 4E from 4E cognition, which we'll talk about another time. So um, so these these practices, and every time I listen to these John talk and and these guys talk, I'm just like, oh my gosh, these practices are so um, relevant and powerful that way, <clears throat> in terms of uh, reaching these places that they're they're speaking about. So and addressing these problems. <clears throat> so so I want to kind of take one piece of their lecture or their conversation and um, use that as kind of a you know, example or a, a illustration of how I think these skills of nature connection and living with the earth and specifically tracking uh, are irrelevant. So, and maybe even inspire you to check them out so that you can feel them and experience this for yourself. So. Um, so, so based on what they were talking about, my, I kind of came up with a proposition or a, um, proposal that, um, when tracking is practiced from the 4E cognition approach, the embodied, embedded, extended, and enacted approach, it offers a participatory and an active experience of relevance realization, which is something we'll get to a little bit with John's work. So <clears throat> what I mean is tracking actually gives you um, a first person. I mean, relevance realization is obviously something we're doing all the time, constantly. It's how we uh, grow, adapt, exist, you know, perceive all of it. But um, Tracking is, is a, 
uh, like a metacognitive skill that lets you participate more fully in that directly with nothing in between, if that makes sense, nothing between you and reality. There's no real um, system or set of knowledge or, well, there's a learning system, uh, learning methodology, but that gets quickly dropped. But it's, so I guess it's, uh, to use John's language again, it's a psychotechnology for uh, enacted experience of relevant, relevance realization is what I'm claiming. So <clears throat> we'll see. Um, so the core concept or the problem that I saw them speaking about, and this is a quote from John. I tried to write it down as accurately as I could, but he was trying to, again, simplify what they were talking about and, and catch people up on two terms. One is emergence and one is emanation. So I'll just read it and then we'll talk about it a little bit. So um, the interdependent relationships of bottom-up emergence due to enabling constraints and the top-down selective constraints create an ongoing evolution of relevance realization. The machinery of relevance realization and intelligibility of things found in the reconciliation of um, emergence and emanation are deeply at one with each other. There's a deep analogy between my cognition in doing relevance realization and the universe as a whole as is moving according to some principle between determinacy and inter interdetermination, indetermination. <laughs> so that might be a little chunky, but let's let's uh, break this down a little bit. So what he was saying was there the there's a relationship between the what we experience in reality, what we notice, especially as humans on the ground here of patterns in our world emerging. And so there's this sense that reality is kind of emerging around us and things just happen and take form. And um, those forms we might recognize as patterns, right? Um, but there's also complementary to that. There's this sense that there's more going on than we can understand. There's, a, there's principles at work deeper um, deeper uh, architecture of reality that we might, you know, in some ways, some beliefs call it, call it spirit or whatever you want, but there's something behind the scenes that is causing or, or, or emanating the form to be um, as it is. And so there's kind of these two perspectives. One is that you know, the emergence is emergence is basically a um, idea. Um, I've experienced it through uh, systems thinking and through um, complexity science, which is basically that the phenomena that happens when parts come together as an integrated whole, and in that whole, they can function or express something that is not found in any of the parts. So the example that John uses and I often use as well is like um, the combination of chemicals, say hydrogen and oxygen, two gases, that when they come together, create water, which is not found, the qualities of water, which is not found in hydrogen or oxygen in gases, but you have this fluid thing that emerges. And so that's, that's emergence. It's, it's something that shows up um, in, the presence of these other parts coming together. So, and emergence is everywhere. You know, it's it's how um, <clears throat> it's at all levels and all scales and all these different dimensions. So, it's in the human dimension. It's it's in your body. You know, your your uh, cells coming together to create the emergent whole that is you. So, um, so that's emergence. Kind of the sense of isn't reality just a bunch of parts coming together and then, you know, um, forming these holes that are, are greater than the sum of the parts. It's like, that's one perspective or one thing that seems to be happening. The other seems to be this, uh, and, and he, by the way, he talks about, um, what do you call it? Um, enabling constraints. 
constraints being these um, relationships that either afford or allow something to be or uh, challenge or select out for something to be. So they, constraints are things that make things possible. So, um, <clears throat> and that seem, seems really weird, but really important. And at the, uh, from the other, so we have the emergence perspective from the emanation perspective, we have what seems to be guiding principles kind of causal constraints uh, that permeate the universe and seem to be consistent, timeless, universal, that are controlling or, or, or shaping what happens and, uh, and selecting what happens, you know, you know, so that not everything happens, not everything that could possibly happen happens, but, you know, things, things uh, happen, you know, taking back to the, uh, the atoms, it's like, there's a consistency in and part of it has to do with the um, electrical charges and the scale of atoms and the uh, the forces that they are comprised of and but those things are consistent and they they are what cause emergence to take the <laughs> to take form as well so it's like it's happening from two directions we have this bottom up things arising and we also have this top down uh, things becoming so anyway so anyway that's uh probably got really confusing but let's see here if i can go on a little bit so so those two in those the interaction of those two things those things happening simultaneously those two directions the top down emanation the bottom up emergence it's not an either or story and what he's saying is that it's a kind of co-arising um these things are interacting or these these methods or systems are interact interacting in ways that create the ongoing evolution of reality so um let's see so the interdependent relationship of bottom-up emergence due to enabling constraints and the top-down uh, selecting constraints of emanation create the ongoing evolution of relevance realization. So relevance realization, from what I understand, is a human, um, central to humans and animals, or things that have consciousness and awareness. And um, the um, relevance realization is kind of the experiential um or the procedural um process of those those uh emergence and emergent and emanating concepts uh being enacted in a living thing i think so he goes on to say that the machinery of re relevance realization and intelligibility of things found in the reconciliation of emanation and um, emergence are deeply at one with each other. Kind of what I was just saying. So there's a deep analogy between my what my cognition is doing in relevance realization. So that's our cognitive process as humans and what the universe as a whole is moving or is doing as it moves towards or moves according to some principle or principles between determinacy or you know actually actual actuality or manifestation maybe and indetermination um so anyway so this this thing here this is the problem that they're chewing on and and it's uh very chewy <laughs> so but there's an experience here and so you know intuitively or experientially this resonates with me because there's a feeling in this especially where these two 
natures <laughs> are coming together and there's this like super dynamic uh interactive evolving feeding off of each other um co-arising thing that comes forth which is um what john's calling relevance realization and that you know that description of that that way of talking about it reminds me or deeply resonates with what i understand uh is the place that the practice of tracking and especially when applied to the skills of living with the earth uh, take us and i think that that's probably not a coincidence because i see tracking as probably you know one of the oldest um cognitive capacities and certainly one of the oldest sciences and, uh, and art forms and the most ubiquitous like it wasn't something that people just did as a pastime like we can we can afford to do now it's it was tracking was um a way of life it was literally how life worked it was paying attention and making sense of and finding meaning in your environment and um that's what tracking is and was and it still is but we have a very uh complex and very uh, sophisticated tools and processes and all of these things that uh shield us from the earth in a way or separate us or insulate us from the earth and from that conversation that is going on directly with the earth so we often have this distorted experience when it comes to connecting with the earth and that can be you know whether it's just how we live you know being separated <clears throat> by what i call our entropy shields which are you know our homes and our heating systems and our um the fact that water is you know is ready to go in the tap and the light switch on all this stuff that creates this simulated or a synthetic um lifestyle that is a good distance from what's actually required to live when we are dealing with wild nature so um <clears throat> So anyway, I feel like um back in those back when we were say closer to the earth or at, you know which we have been for most of our existence and I'm including even pre-human time because we see animals uh demonstrate basic tracking skills whether it be through scent and and following you know trails or um sneaking and paying attention and and noticing disturbances and stuff through uh often through smell but also sound and sometimes visually animals can tell if if there's been a disturbance on an area they know so you know that's tracking isn't very old if we take it back to pre-human and then and it's instinctive in that sense but also once it became a systematic science and practice then um and it was taught it was actually um you know compounded it wasn't just just using how we perceive to pay attention and make sense of stuff it was actually like hey we can we can do this in a way that uh makes us better at it and makes us more likely to thrive so um okay i need to gather my thoughts here so i know i haven't really talked specifically about what tracking is yet and I'm going to do that in another one. I want to introduce it. But uh this whole conversation just got me so worked up, so stoked on this this idea. So um so where that conversation went then John mentioned that you know relevance realization was the 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 thing <laughs> thing the dynamic process that he uh describes is going on in that in that argument he also mentioned that let me just read this part here um he mentioned a book that i really enjoyed as well i've 
It's one of the few that I have read that he recommended. Um, I read it before he actually recommended it, but it's called Infinite Games or Finite and Infinite Games by James Kars, I believe. And um, he was talking about, you know, there's a distinction between finite and infinite games. Finite games are games that you play to win. Um, generally, there's a known objective, there's known players, and there's rules, there's um, an expectation of, of, and there's a way, a way to win versus infinite games, which is, which are, you know, the rules change, uh, the players change, the context changes. And the only thing that the only way to win is to keep playing, in other words, to survive. And so it's, it's a very vital perspective when it comes to survival, but and the skills of survival. But uh, he brought it up in terms of the idea of not just an infinite game, but thinking in terms of infinite game, but an infinite narrative. And I really thought that was interesting. He said, um, um, if, let's see, sorry, let me see if I can find this. What we need is a trans narrative. He was cautious on that word, but, um, and, and cautious on meta narrative as well. But there's a trans narrative dialectic practice that reconciles the nested emergence and emanation relationships the dynamic we were talking about a minute ago. And if we can en enact the coming together of emergence and emanation within an open-ended dialect, dialectic, which is an enacted symbol of the way the logos of the universe unfolds. Um, okay, so that chunk there, that became um, another piece to me of what tracking affords us. So trans narrative dialectic practice i really like that because tracking is one of the ways it can be seen is tracking uh as i understand it or i have come to understand and how i was taught it is it's uh leads to a place that's very different than you might expect when you first get into it because it's it is definitely uh, doing something to your body mind and um, patterning you in a certain way. So tracking is could be seen as a um, the fundamental grammar. It's another language for sure. But the language and the, the medium that you're reading is everything. It's not, you know, words or it's not um, even like music, which is very uh, very powerful as a language, but it's it's literally everything, everything, every process, and every relationship in its interactions around you. Doesn't that it's not out, it's not out in the woods. It's not something you go do out in the woods. It's not a not looking at footprints in the ground, which it includes, but it is a um, engaging in <clears throat> reality as a mystery. Uh, and a it's a it's an infinite game and it's infinite story where everything around you becomes meaningful and this is one of the ways that i think it's very uh vital and powerful in uh addressing the meaning crisis just in the literal direct way is that suddenly the entire world the entire earth around you everything becomes meaningful because of a, a game you're playing or the story you are uh, trying to become part of. So this trans-narrative dialectic practice, <clears throat> um, the story of all stories, you know, the, uh, the universe, the, the one verse as a whole, um, this is what tracking relates to. This is the story that it is quote reading and that's the, the grammar that it is providing is it's providing a gra grammar that allows you to do that so it's a dialectic practice in that you are in and this is how master trackers talk about it too you're in conversation with the earth with reality with everything around you and you become part of this conversation because you're not you're no longer walking on the ground 
like observing, you know, it out there, you are moving from the nature within you and feeling and responding to the same degree, everything around you. Um, I mean, maybe to, as an example, like um, if you are out in the woods and you came across a magnificent animal of some kind that you knew uh, was superior to you in the food chain, let's say it's a big bear or something. And, you know, if that animal looks at you with, with any kind of, uh, uh, you know, if there's some sort of conflict or aggression, you're going to feel scared. You're going to feel some sort of fear and you probably won't even, it won't even be a cognitive fear. It's a bodily fear, right? It's a respect and a numinous fear. <laughs> it's something that you can't not do. And it's, uh, maybe not terrifying, but you're going to have this instinctive, perhaps before you even see the thing, um, response, as does everything else around you, you know, especially if something is being disruptive um, in the environment. So, so I guess what I mean is you get to co you get to uh, participate as part of nature, and you're not just doing something in nature or to nature or, you know, exploring nature you are nature uh, listening and engaging and conversing with nature and it's not in a esoteric weird way it's in a literal uh, interpreting patterns and disturbances and relationships <clears throat> as information around you in the earth in any substrate and it's not even in the ground only i mean that's obviously where a lot of tracks as we think of them are but tracks also include any kind of sign you know it could be um an animal home it could be a trail it could be claw marks on a on a tree or scat on the ground or or uh the weather you know and how that's influencing the animals the insects and the birds and the, you know the plant life it could be the way a plant's growing it could be how much sun something gets the the amount of water it holds all of these things become information in this massive inter interwoven uh, or interlocking story that is dynamic and constant and we are part of it and our cognition plugs right into it as as a at an instinctive level but also at a conscious level you know to where we can ask questions and make sense of things and kind of direct the process and that's what a lot of the training provides is how to sort for these patterns and um, make sense of things in this otherwise overwhelming you know story so even though the, the story is overwhelming as you practice and as you get more familiar with the environment and with the baseline you aren't overwhelmed in the same way because all of the gaps in your knowledge and in your familiarity and in your understanding are starting to fill in and all of your relationships are getting tighter and tighter until you have um an, an intimate understanding and connection to everything around you and it changes how you move and how you uh gather firewood and how you know and how you, uh, where you build your shelter, and how, you, what time, what time of day you uh, do certain things, and this is all in just naturally in reacting to um, a flow of understanding and knowledge and relationship you're gaining with everything else around you. So, I kind of got off into a little more about what tracking is there, but so it's you know it's. It is a patterning of yourself to engage with this massive story and let everything be mysterious and everything be ever expanding. And in that way that John talks about that I really like um, of describing sacred where, you know, thing, things are inexhaustibly revealing themselves as deeper and deeper. And in that, in that mode, you know, everything is doing that. <laughs> 
And so, you know, every little, every bird, every interaction, every t plant, plants are no longer, you know, just green stuff. And then, and then they go from green stuff to maybe weeds, they go from weeds to like medicine and like important um, nutrients and important members of an ecosystem that are, that are um, essential and, and incredibly wise and intelligent for what they're doing, you know? So, um, okay. So let me uh, move on to, or let's see if I actually covered that. So the trans narrative dialectic practice that reconciles the nested emergence and emanation relations. So when you get into this, when you get into this trans narrative story that tracking is, lets you in on, um, again, you're being, you're being, you're becoming part of it. You're, you're embedded in it deeply and you, you know, you, f you start to realize that, you know, tracking is is, is essentially noticing disturbances in a baseline or in an environment. And as you track, as you start to notice these things, you're noticing is a disturbance or it has at least an impact. And you start to sense that impact in, it's like being in, in underwater, you know, where you are, you're aware of every movement and every gesture is creating waves out, right? And those waves, and from everything else, there's waves coming back to you. And um, those waves are, you know, attention and they are, um, you know, I don't like to use the word energy, but it's like their, their relationship and their uh, information, you know? So, um, so I, I feel like in a way that tracking can, as a practice, reconcile these emerging and emanating relationships, um, because it puts you, at least from a human perspective, right in the middle of that. And it makes you keenly aware of, uh, patterns at every level and, the, I think the reason it's, it makes you attuned to that is you start to see deeper into things. In fact, things aren't just things. Things become processes. You start to see things over time, like through dimensionally. Uh, tracking is obviously looking into the past and also making predictions of the future based on some information that you're engaged with in the now. Um, so you're in some part of that story and your mind actually ends up working in different directions along that storyline simultaneously. <laughs> so you're seeing the past, maybe even imaginally, so to the point that you start to, you know, you're looking at some deer tracks and you start to actually see the deer moving through them in your mind. And then you see the deer pause in the tracks and you see the head turn you see the bird alarm that's emanating her, no word, but it's broadcasting over to the deer, causing that pause, right? <clears throat> As the, the bird is reacting to something that's, you know, making it react. So there's this whole, this whole play of uh, attention and, and tension and pressure that's going on through the environment that you become tied into. So this, um, so that's, you know, looking at the past, but it also gives you information into the future. It gives you an idea of, you know, how that story plays on and you start to get these um, uh, hypothetical little simulations of what might be and like what could be happening. Some plausibility patterns of where the deer might be now or where this, what happened after that. Um, and meanwhile, you're in that puzzle as well. You're deep in that, you're meshed in there. So it could be that the bird alarm was due to you walking down the trail that made the deer move. And so you're sitting there looking at a trail that says, oh, look, a deer moved because of you, you know? <laughs> and so you threw bird. And so it's, it's, um, it's very, uh, yes, yeah, super connective and, and grounding that way. And, sh and keeps you feeling, it makes you aware of this dynamic um, unfolding and very much 
occurring in the moment. Um, inter interaction between emerging and emanating patterns. So the, the constraints. So, um, and I'll try to be more clear about that in another video. I'm not gonna be able to get into constraints very much, but so um, the last part of that. So transnarrative trans dialectic practice that reconciles the nested emergence and emanation relationships if we enact the coming together of emergence and emanation with an open-ended dialectic, which is, which is an enacted symbol of the way of the logos of the entire of the universe unfolds. So enacting it, enacting that process, I feel like, uh, again, tracking is a good candidate for that, that um, practice of enacting it. And um, I'm starting to run out of uh, <laughs> coherent thoughts on that, but uh, let me go on a little bit and then I'm going to wrap this up. So I just want to say a couple more things about tracking and maybe this will come back to why it's a good candidate for that. So um, tracking, as I have come to understand it, provides provides a narrative for this, I was calling it a transjective position uh, of this trans narrative. So you're not simply, it's again, being, being invited in and being part of something, but also having this witness or transjective perspective of that process. So you're not just doing stuff. <clears throat> um, okay, so it provides a narrative for the, tracking provides a narrative for the transjective position by bringing the emerging patterns and emanating principles together into a meaningful story of reality in every moment. There is no intermediary representation other than one's own perception and direct conversation with the earth. So that's an interesting thing. You know, this isn't something you find in through a book or through a uh, a system. The only system, that, the only purpose for the system is to get you there to a place where you are. Um, where you drop the system, where you are just living it, right? And uh, just experiencing it. And so, and the it is this direct conversation, not in words, a uh, sub trans linguistic, you know, it's a grammar of feeling of image of it's, it's, uh, it's like, it takes over your thinking and feeling and and your cognitive apparatus to where you are perceiving what's going on around you as if you were reading a story. Um, and in some cases to immense detail, like immense detail. <laughs> um, there's no, yeah, so there's no intermediary intermediate representation. We don't need to go through something. It's a, this direct contact with the earth. And there's um, nowhere to go or no one to ask but your, but your earth and our heart, which I'm just kind of using as a symbol for your body mind or your embodied self. So <clears throat> um, to me, this is direct relationship and dialogos. Uh, and transmission with reality through our cognition. There's no story to interpret other than the one song, the one verse, the universe. And we're not looking at, um, to describe a little bit more about what tracking might look like. So uh, a track, to take an example, a track is not a thing. This is where it gets, this is really wild. This is the insight I got, you know, some time ago 
in my tracking practice where I started to realize that I was following these tracks and following these footprints. Well, I'm like, what am I following? What am I looking at here? Because there was nothing there, no thing there. There literally wasn't. You know, if I'm following a, a deer or a coyote or a person or something, I'm looking at footprints in the soil. What am I looking at? You know, I'm looking at a disturbance. I'm looking at a pattern of disturbance that is a representation of an interaction or a relationship of something and something else, the you know, an entity in the earth, an agent in the arena. And that's it. I'm looking at a relationship is what I was looking at. So that became very strange that here's all these, you know, we call it to, under, to explain them and talk about them and stuff. We think of them as things, you know, their tracks are over there, they're on the ground, but they, they literally themselves are just these representations of uh, literally of energy, like, you know, kinetic energy moving through a substrate and they're showing relationships because all of those patterns aren't just patterns they actually mean something like they can be reverse engineered back to the cause you know head position uh, how fast someone's going how tired they are how hungry they are how what where they're going direction of travel um what they might be intending to do how much how big they are it says all this stuff you know that uh you can find represented in that pattern and um um, but you know, with the, with the practice of tracking gives you is not a, <clears throat> it doesn't end with like, oh, and then you go look in a field guide to find out what that is. You actually develop your own relationship cognitively to these patterns to where you are getting in real time, a replay, just like an, an imaginal, to use Jones language, uh, an imaginal replay of what happened as if it's happening right in front of you. You might've seen this in some movies, they do this pretty well. They show kind of like what a tracker sees, you know, they're, they're looking at the landscape and they kind of tap into this. It's almost like time travel. That's what it feels like is you're, you're, you're in the now and then you see a deer run by in your mind and you're like, you like, you literally see this thing and um, you know, it's not there, but it was there. And it starts, so it starts to really get interesting. So, and if you really press that, you could start to see, you know, you really got open to it. You could um, see a lot of things happening all at once. Um, and some of them are off, you know, you're not right every time. Some of them are hypothesis and you can tell sometimes they're a little fuzzier or a little like, uh, you know, that wasn't very clear. But sometimes when it's really clear, it's just like you're watching it happen. It's, it's, um, comes with all of the the feeling as if you were there so yeah time travel <laughs> um the uh that's another way that it's connected by the way right so it's a relationship through time so you can actually have in the present have these weird connections very profound connections to past and future through um playing the game of tracking um and that's just i'm you know i'm still focusing on like footprints, kind of the classical tracking, but again, it's every interaction. It's, it's the wear patterns on my desk here, you know? It's the way that my car is parked. It's the way, it's how, uh, how the gravel, the texture of the gravel on the driveway. It's, you know, where the cobwebs are and where they aren't in my house, um, where the dust is and, <clears throat> and uh, everything. So, um, so anyway, I got to this point where tracks aren't things, they're relationships and okay, that's weird. You know, it's literally, there's nothing there. I'm tracking. I'm not looking exactly at the soil because I kind of am, but that actually is the canvas. So, I'm, and I'm not looking at a foot either because that's not there. So what am I looking at this interaction? Um, so tracking is nothing more than a manifestation of relationship and uh to and it it's at that scale anyway kind of this uh <laughs> laying uh, the, the symbolic representation of the relationships between the emerging patterns and the emanating principles is one way i 
kind of see it. So uh, let's see, there's no such thing as a track. A track is part of a continuum of conversation expressed in the relationship between all things and processes over time. Things cease to be only things and processes cease to only be processes. Relationships become real and all becomes a complex unity reaching through space, time, matter, and energy. It's just some notes I was taking earlier, trying to explain this. Um, <clears throat> this stimulates the imaginal capacity as we project these plausible events onto the now with our cognition. And this, this whole idea is, uh, what's even cooler about this is, you know, even though that's a profound capacity that we have to do this kind of intuitively and in, in our tracking lineages, they refer to it as spirit tracking where you might get insights based on very little information. Uh, I think John talks about it as uh, implicit patterns. Um, I don't remember, we'll get there. But, um, you know, basically you're ma making decisions out of very little information. You're, you're <clears throat> um, and that's another way of explaining intuition, I suppose. So, but that's, you know, spirit tracking is just knowing through familiarity and relationship, knowing instead of if you're hunting for something, for example, trying to follow every footprint of a deer to get to where the deer is so that you can uh, harvest it is the kind of the naive approach compared to, you know, you ask hunters that have been doing it for a long time, they just go to where the deer are, <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, why, why try to follow them and do all that stuff? Just go where they're going to be, you know, and how do you explain that? That's, that's embodied relationship. You know, that's, that's being embedded in the thing to where it's just natural. It's like, as natural as going to the fridge, why would you go anywhere else for food, you know, in your house? So, <clears throat> um, so this is a, it's, it's a profoundly grounding practice and tracking affords meaning in everything that is in everything because everything becomes a story. Everything becomes process and often we use i'll get into this with another video when i get into more of the how of tracking but we get into we use questions often you know the who what where when why how questions um to guide this process of inquiry and embracing mystery and becoming part of this trans narrative that is um permeates everything that everything is part of there's no, there's no exceptions. It's not like it's only out in the woods or, you know, it's, it's all the man-made things. It's everything. And so it's just a way, a perspective of, and a game to play that brings this narrative to life and allows you to step into it with nothing in between. So uh, it, it embeds you directly into the arena of nature. So what's even better is that this is also a practice. Tracking is a science, an art form, and a philosophy that has been crafted since our pre-human existence and codified into a system, systematic grammar of nature, which can be learned like any other language or skill. And so that is what's exciting to me as well, is we're not just having to reinvent the wheel or just kind of wander through this, but this has been preserved and taught and passed on and even you know uh societies of close to the earth had trackers had had their knowledge keepers and had ways of making sure that this art form was perfected you know my teacher was trained by a taught by a, a, an apache elder and the apaches were very well known for their abilities to track but all over the world you know the aborigines and Generally, anywhere there was a sand-based culture, uh, that's where it became obvious, um, you know, because it's just like laying there in the sand, and pretty soon you just spend a lot of time with it, putting the puzzle together, and and you get a bunch of information. How cool is that? But also in cultures where, like where I live, it's way more, a lot more uh, undergrowth and and um, 
very little exposed ground. So you get into sign tracking, being able to see disturbances kind of three-dimensionally in grass and trees and shrubs and the way things grow. And um, <clears throat> you don't get the same exact clear detail, but you get kind of this other, other perspective. So anyway, so there's, there's a ton of ways to get into this if you are interested in trying on this practice. And one is you can contact me and we'll, <laughs> I can I do mentor people on this, but also um, I'm gonna try and share some shorter videos more and more uh, of how to practice, like some simple things to do. But uh, um, I think for now, one to try on is the idea that everything is a mystery, you know? And that can be explained, you know, John explains that through an example he uses that I, I would say kind of correlates is the idea of combinatorial explosion, you know, the, the infinite aspects that everything has that are surrounding us and how we can't truly know something, which is what my teacher, um, Tom Brown, would refer to is from his teacher um, that, you know, everything is infinitely rich and you can't truly know something. Um, so, so just playing the game that, you know, there's, there's mystery out there and everything is part of it and it has meaning. And, and if you knew the question to ask or the perspective to take, you could potentially unlock that part of the story. And, um, um i think for now we'll just leave it at that but uh, we'll get into some tracking exercises next time uh, or another time so anyway so for those of you that are familiar with john's work this might make a little bit of sense and for those of you who are not there's probably a bunch of language in there that is hmm, maybe not gonna do much for you but uh hopefully some of my uh descriptions of tracking my my translation of what tracking is made some sense and kind of give you a feeling of what's possible in this trans narrative ever present story that we are invited to be in conversation with directly with the earth. And um, yeah, so anyway, I'd love to help you discover that story and that practice and try it on and tell me what you think in terms of whether or not it's a good candidate for these uh, dialectic processes and, and practices. So that help us um, find this uh, understanding of these two, bring together emergence and emanation into one understanding. So this might be a practice that can give us a little more insight in that direction, I think. so. Thanks for watching and thank you, John and Jonathan and Paul for your uh, lecture that was really inspiring or your conversation lecture. And I look forward to doing some more and tracking this whole thing. All right, take care and keep going.